me up after that group. <laughs> that was wrong, that was wrong, that was wrong. That was absolutely phenomenal, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 I thought John Bates was my friend here in Delaware. <laughs> to uh, the department secretary of the Department of Children and Family Services, Ms. Kelly. Yes. <laughs> John Bates, the director of the foster care program here in the state of Delaware, and to all of the other dignitaries um, who have helped to make up this great office body and for all of us together. To my dear brother, um, Reverend, I want to call it Reverend, uh, William Kelly Brew, let's give him a big hand. What's he been on this morning? It was, a real, it was a real treat to be here, and for many more reasons than one. So we look forward to some future work together with um, Brother William. Um, I have been invited down to talk about some of my personal experiences in the foster care system in Los Angeles County. It's so all over 3,000 miles away and on a whole different coast. Um, I am absolutely convinced that issues and concerns involving children out on placement are the same across the United States, its 50 states and its territories. And so I'm going to just share some slides and uh, pictures with you in and throughout my presentation that I think will help frame a little bit of what I want to talk about. And so again, I want to thank John and all of the individuals who helped make this possible for me to be here with you all today. How many foster parents do we have in the room? Can you just raise your hand? How many foster parents? Give, give, give them a big hand. That is absolutely phenomenal. I've been reading about you all here in Delaware and the great work that you do as foster parents and the associations in your respective counties and municipalities. And what I really wanted to do is stop by to say thank you. Um, thank you for all of the work that you do. Anywhere in the country, America's foster care system, child welfare system, in my mind, is made up of four constituent groups. One is, when they're here on the screen, biological parents who, unfortunately, some through fault of their own, others perhaps through no fault of their own, have come to a place where they can no longer care for their children in the confines of their own home. Usually, some traumatic event or experience has brought them as Paul's children to be removed from their biological parents' homes. And so biological parents are the first constituency group, and then the children who are removed from those homes, second constituency group. The third constituency group are the workers. And I don't call them case workers, because when I was a kid, I didn't want to be a number, and I didn't want to just be a case in somebody's file. I wanted to be a person that had face and identity and background and experience. And so I hope those of you who are workers in the system don't just consider us cases and don't consider yourself case workers. You all are on the front lines of fighting a war to help keep families together and children stable until they can get back with their families. And I think you ought to give yourselves a big hand as well. All of those who work in the department, in the division, or in whatever capacity you may work in. And so I call you support workers, because you are there to support children and families until the bridge happens for them to get reconnected to their, their families. And then we'll talk about uh, the foster parents um, themselves. Those of you, I believe John mentioned there's almost 250 plus of you here in the room today. That is absolutely phenomenal and for you opening your home. So I've got four thank yous. I want to thank the foster parents for opening your home and loving children who are not yours biologically, but who are yours spiritually. How many of you know these have become your spiritual children, haven't they? They're not just children passing through the night. They are your children. And I have watched foster parents who themselves have been unable to biologically have fat children and embrace and ingratiate children into their home and as love them as if they're their own 
natural, biological children. So thank you, foster parents. We're here because of you today. Thank you, support workers, for planting seeds of hope and believing in children who have been traumatized and helping them to be resilient overcomers. I'm going to talk a little bit more about resilience and overcoming a little bit later. To our foster children for tapping into that faith, hope, and love to believe that you are more than conquerors and courageous overcomers. And how many you know we need to plant that seed over and over and over and over again? Because a child who's been removed from their parents can never tire of hearing that I'm an overcomer and I'm a conqueror. I can make it. I can do it. Those are the messages that we need to tell the children who are in Delaware's foster care system, child welfare system, and in America's child welfare system all over the country. And then lastly, um, for those foster children, I'm doing lastly with those foster children, I want to just talk a little bit about um, some work that I'm doing with the Prevent Child Abuse America Board. Some of you are familiar with PCA. PCA oversees the Healthy Families Home Visiting Model. Um, we are in about 50, all 50 states and territories within America, so it's one of our, America's largest and oldest child abuse prevention program, or agencies, I should say. So along with Children's Defense Fund, Child Welfare League of America, Zero to Three, and other agencies, PCA does great work. And, and, and part of what I'm proud of as a board member of PCA is to promote a movement to help us um, indeed support America's foster children not just the children in the system, but how do we keep children out of the system? And it has been an, an age-old um, adage to say that our child welfare system, if you would liken it to pulling children out of water, you've heard this before, I'm sure, and yet somebody's got to be bold enough, audacious enough, and brave enough to go upstream and figure out why there are children in the river in the first place, and how do we prevent more children from falling into the river? That's not to say, that's to give, give, give yourself a hand. That is not to say that we stop pulling the children out of the river because guess what? Children are drowning. Children are at risk. They are imperiled. And because of the drug epidemic, the gang epidemic, and the gun epidemic, we are finding more children who are not able to stay with their biological families and are therefore being placed in surrogate families. And I'm just a believer. If God allowed two people to make a baby, I believe God is calling those same two people to take care of that baby. Now, in some instances and many, in a growing number, those two who make the baby are not able and probably right now should not be take care of that baby. And that's a hard thing to say when you remove a child from the biological family. Because if I don't, if all I've known is abnormalcy in my life, that becomes normal to me. And so therefore, if I'm taken away, I don't know mama's drug addicted on crack cocaine, I'm four or five years old, I just want to be back with mama. And that's part of what my experiences were as a kid growing up in South Central LA. And so we need to continue the movement. And time out for, I belong to this agency. I belong to that agency. A ch America's children are in peril, and we need some folk who can put aside their personal agendas, personal egos, personal agencies, and say, I'm willing to come together with whoever and whosoever is willing to fight the good fight of faith to keep families strong. Because we are already living in a fragmented society. And children are already fragmented, taken out of their places of familiarity. And so why should we then subject them to greater um, fragmentation by saying, if you want this, come to my agency over here. But if you want that, go to that agency over there. And if you want this, go to that agency over there. Why do we send them through so many revolving doors? How come there just can be one place where they can come and say, listen, I need some help. And whatever help I need, I need you all to get together and get off your egos and figure out how to make it work for me and my family. That's what we need to be about, ladies and gentlemen, in this room, all over Delaware, all over New Jersey, and all over America. So there's a movement afoot. And, and I am in conversation with friends of mine at um, Child Welfare League of America, Chris James Brown, and with Jim Aroba to PCA, and with, uh, with um, great folk at, at, at Dr. Mary Wright 
Edelman at, at uh, Children's Defense Fund and um, Claire Lerner at the Zero to Three and other agencies to say, how do we come together to form and propel this movement to serve America's families and to support America's children? So I want to let you know that that's happening. If you don't know much about that, I would ask if there's a local, any local PCA chapters represented in this room, all right, there you go. And I want you to talk to my sister, and if there are other agencies, I want you to figure out how do we get involved with this movement that's taking place around the country. Um, let me talk a little bit about um, a real gift that I had back in 2006. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about my background, but before I do, I'm going to share a little bit about my, my own professional experiences in, in the child welfare system. So for three years, I got a chance to work in New Jersey as the director of the division of Child Abuse Prevention and Community Partnerships. It was a time in New Jersey's state life when we were reforming our child welfare system. It was a sad, high-profile child death case. Every state in the union has had a high-profile child death, child death case. And in this case, it was a young seven-year-old boy in Newark, New Jersey, by the name of Fahim Williams. But he was in custody in Newark in what we call DIFAS, Division of Youth and Family Services. It was our CPS, it was our Child Protective Services System. So he had been in placement. I don't know how long he had been in placement, but what we do know is that for a month and a half, his little body lay stuck in a plastic barrel over Christmas and decomposing over the Christmas holidays. Killed while he was in here. And how many of us have seen that kind of sad, traumatic case? It sent seismic shockwaves through New Jersey's child welfare system. We were sued by children's rights, which has done a lot of suits like this around the country. And, and it was a blessing in disguise because had that not suit had not happened, we would not have gone the federal mandate and receivership. Had that not happened, the New Jersey State Legislature would not have mandated and authorized over three hundred and fifty million dollars to reform and revamp New Jersey's child welfare right. system. It was one of the few times that we saw that kind of infusion of funds, and yet it came at the martyr death of a seven-year-old boy. There had been other child deaths before Fahim, but Fahim captured our attention, arrested our sad imaginations, and made us reform. And so it was around that time that John Corzine was coming into office, and former governor, former governor of New Jersey, and the former U.S. Senator, if you know him, as the former CEO of Goldman Sachs on, on Wall Street. And, and so in his political career, this was a looming charge to him, reform New Jersey's child welfare system. And so we began to do new case practice models, and as William talked about earlier, trauma-informed practice within the frontline staff. How many of you know, it's just not the frontline workers that need to be trauma-informed. It's also midline supervisors and high-ranking administrators that also need to be trauma-informed. Because what I've learned is you can do all the training for the frontline folk, but if those supervisors don't have the same value system as the frontline folk, they're going to say, I don't care what you just went through, I'm still the supervisor. Now, I don't want to get nobody in trouble, so be careful how you back. <laughs> but as I say in my congregation, amen like love. I know I'm telling the truth. So, so we were reforming our child welfare system. And so I had the great privilege of being the director. So we had CPS, Division of Youth Family Services. We had Child Behavioral Health, Division of Child Behavioral Health. And then I was given this third arm of state government, the Division of Child Abuse Prevention. A hundred million dollars budget, and I was responsible for promoting programs that would get to families before they got into crisis. And I was charged of trying to figure out a roadmap towards prevention in New Jersey's child welfare system. And so the question we asked then is the same question we ask now, how do you prevent child abuse and neglect? How do you prevent the kind of traumatic experiences, uh, events that happened to Fahim Williams? There was a, another story that made us reset or modify our, our child welfare agreement. There was a the Jackson case, which is in Collegewood, New Jersey. Three, four brothers, two of which were found scrounging in a trash can. The one bore their brother, the neighbor saw the boy and saw him digging through the trash can. He weighed about 50-something pounds. 
And when the CPS came out and did another investigation, because they had already been out there, they found that the boy who weighed 50 pounds was 19 years old. Oh. They could do the trash can because he didn't have enough. I can tell you case after case after case. I can tell you a case of a young 25-year-old mother in Camden, New Jersey, America, one of America's poorest city, who on a PCP bench had an argument with her boyfriend who wasn't the baby's daddy. Talk about baby mama drama, right? We laugh, but it's real. She went on a PCC, PCP bench, argued with her boyfriend, and whatever transpired in that home, led to the decapitation of a two-year-old baby. Who well, then she put the head in a refrigerator and waited till the police came. I wish I were making this up. And then recently I just did a memorial service at our church for a family, and this may see an end, some of you heard about this, a hostage situation. We have, man, I, I feel for what you shared with us earlier, because it, it was so eerily reminiscent of what these children in Trenton just went through. A boyfriend, a mother of five, boyfriend, takes, has an argument or whatever transpired, kills the mother, kills her 13-year-old son, leaves the bodies in the house to decompose, and has a hostage standoff with Trent police for a week, for several days, but the body had already been there a week. And the three children, one 18, one 14, one 6, or 5, watched their mother shot and murdered, watched their brother murdered, and then stayed in a home while their bodies decomposed for a week and a half. And to boot, there was an autistic 19-year-old son in the basement, locked up. And I had to stand before this family and call them all the resources I could from above to speak life and hope to a family who had been so victimized and traumatized. And so we're living in serious situations. And so how do you make, how do you prevent these kinds of things from happening? I've come to the one solution. We came to it in New Jersey. The only way you can prevent child abuse and neglect is by making families stronger. And the only way you can make families stronger is by giving them the resources they need before they get into crisis. Why do we wait for a system or why do we wait for children to be beaten and abused before we get family resources that they should have gotten, could have gotten, would have gotten years earlier and it could have saved a child's life and prevented the displacement of a family. And yet we are still waiting for brokenness to happen before we invest in America's families. And so like Lyndon B. Johnson did some 45, 45, 50 years ago, we need a war on poverty again in the United States of America. I know terrorism is going on, but we need a war on poverty. I know Bin Laden has been captured and murdered, but we need a war on poverty here in the United States of America. If I could spend a billion dollars on a spy plane and a drone over in the Middle East, I ought to be able to spend a billion dollars on America's children right here in the United States. And so, beloved, I believe that the work that we must do must be not just a roadmap, but it must become our daily walk to help families and children in America. Many of you know the protective factors. I'm engaged in a campaign where I'm trying to translate these protective factors for clergy and houses of worship. I am a big proponent. I'm an ordained Baptist preacher, I'm unabashed, and unashamed about it, but I also preach religious tolerance because we live in a world that is so religiously intolerant. I can name you famines and wars that at the root are supposed religious arguments. And if I believe in my God who is a God of love, peace, and justice, and you believe in your God who is a God of love, peace, and justice, how come we can't figure out how to coexist and not kill each other if both our God in love, peace, and justice? And so these protective factors are factors that are spoken about in SAMHSA, in the Child Work Formation Gateway, and at the Ministry for Children and Families. But I contend that America's clerics and ecclesiastical leaders see families every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And the thing that I do is engage families, adopted families, biological families, nuclear families, grandmama-led families, um, auntie-led families. That's what priests need. 
imams, pastors, rabbis do. And we need, I respect the separation of church and state, but I'm here to tell you that we are on the front lines of America's houses of worship in seeing the decay and disintegration of America's families. And if we all want to figure out how to make this thing better, we can't separate ourselves because of the separation of church and state. We need to figure out how to respect the First Amendment, but work together with America's houses of worship. If you choose not to work with me as a pastor in Trenton, you are omitting a great resource on the ground in Trenton, New Jersey. And so I need, we need to figure out a way to help clergy understand the language and the mental health arena and the folk, the practitioners in the mental health arena understand what clergy do. Social connections, I do it every Sunday. I bring folk together. And throughout the week, social connections. Concrete supports in time of need, I call it benevolent. I get a knock on my door, pastor, I can't pay our bills this week. Can the church help me? Talking about resilience, that's what I do when I preach hope and inspiration and overcoming. That is at the heart of resilience. What does it mean to bounce back from a setback? And so I have my own language, right? I can talk to you about the technical definition of resilience, when an object is decompressed and deformed and it seeks to regain its, its original shape. But I don't have time to go through a scientific definition when I've got gangbangers and drug dealers and folk on the street corners in church. I've got to help folk understand what does it mean to bounce back from a setback. Because at the heart of the matter, I don't care if you got a tie on or if you got blue rag or red rag and yet to uh, mid MS 13, whatever, right? We all have setbacks in our lives. Every single one of us, from John Bates to Miss Kelly, all the way down to folk in Dover and Wilmington and all over this great state, America's first state, everybody in Delaware is going to experience a setback. And it is not whether you have a setback. The art and the science is, how do you bounce back from a setback? That's what we need to figure out. And that's what resilience is. And so of all the protective factors, I'm honing in on resilience. And so as I continue on with my, my presentation, I want to get to three statements. How do we cultivate a cultivated mindset of resilience? Well, the first answer is to acknowledge and affirm that every family has strengths. We have talked about it earlier. Forget time out for a deficit-based um, hospital model of, of, of in family engagement. It's not time to fix families. You gotta acknowledge that every family has something to contribute, something to offer, something positive. I don't care how broken we may think they are, inherent and in, in, in inside of them is something that cries out, I'm not just a victim. And I'm not just a number. I bring something to the table. And if you really want to work with me, you need to figure out how to help acknowledge that I bring something to the table. Otherwise, you are practicing an outdated, outmoded form of social work that is going to only going to lead to perpetuation of a dependent state in America. We need to practice strength-based engagement of families. And the way you do that is by acknowledging Every family has strengths. If I were to use religious language, I'd say it's the Imago Dei. Inside of every single one of us is the image of God. And the sooner I acknowledge that, the better off we all will be. And so that's the way you promote resilience. Another way you promote resilience is by giving families access to resources, strength-based, non-biased, community-based, before they get into crisis. I, one of the things I'm very proud of in New Jersey is that we started, under my watch, a statewide system of family success centers. And those success centers are opportunities for any family to come into any center that we fund, state-funded, and say, I need help. Black, white, Muslim, Christian, young, old, doesn't matter. Because the stigmatization does, is what precludes access to resources. Now, if we can help any family, maybe we can save some family. And that's what we're trying to do, and I know you all are doing similar work here in, in Delaware. And then we need to build an interagency and interdepartmental channels of communication, cooperation, and coordination. Those are three ways that you can promote resilience in families here in the state of Delaware. And, and I look forward to this, continue to be a friend and a partner with you. Let me rush on to my, my the rest of my presentation. 
I don't have time to talk about America's poverty system, right? 21% of America's poverty, of children, live in poverty. Uh, every year, the Children's Defense Fund does an annual report, and in that report, statistics like these are produced. I got this straight from the report, and here's the, here's the thing that continues to just um, create angst inside of me. 21%, one of five of all of America's children live in poverty, but look at the racial breakdown. 33% of black children, one of every three, 71.2% of black children today are still born out of wedlock. I think that statistic is connected to this statistic. And then look at our Hispanic Latino brothers and sisters. What we don't have on here is Asian, Asian, American Indian families. And yet, and I don't care what race, I don't want white children, black children, Latino children, I don't want any of America's children living in poverty. But that is the statistic that we are dealing with, ladies and gentlemen. And we need to figure out because one of the pre biggest predictors of child abuse and neglect is poverty. And so if we're going to change child abuse and neglect, we got to change poverty. Let me, let, me, let me go on to my the rest of my presentation and talk a little bit about my mom and our story. I'm going to close on, on our story. My mom, was, if she had presented at any of your agencies, she would have presented as a teenage mother who was substance abusing who had intimate partner violence. Talk, we have talked a lot about that earlier. Child abuse and maltreatment, involvement of law enforcement in their own, and involved in juvenile family court. All before her first two children, myself and my younger brother, were even five years old. All that was going on. Mama presented with those issues. Mama was 14 when she got pregnant with me, 15. This is 1968 in the heart of South Central LA. Born on Hollywood Boulevard, Kaiser Permanente Hospital, and yet Mama was still a baby, didn't know how to raise a baby, and so we got and I and I've been looking at my own family genealogy, genealogy, and I have a sense of why Mama got pregnant so young. She had her own sense of molestation and abuse, and children who have been victimized early on in their lives, if they don't get help, as we have talked about, they will either acculturate to or become normalized into that practice of behavior. And there's not only just the, the, the belief that she was victimized, we believe that she was a victim of incest. So it's no surprise that her mom got pregnant at 14. By the time she was 19, she had her second baby. And so mama, again, this is the only picture I have, the youngest picture, and one of the only ones I have is a baby of me. I look at Mama's eyes in this picture, and the eyes of one of the soul, that Mama's eyes are quite a bit different than this picture. Because this picture, she had lost all four of her boys, had been the victim of repeated violence and intimate partner abuse, domestic violence, had been in and out of jail, substance abuse, dealing with her own issues. And Mama, unfortunately, never was able to overcome her addiction. And so when I was five and my brother was two, Mama's boyfriend and, and, and she were inside smoking crack, put little, I remember them putting little things on the spoon, lighting a cigarette, light it under the spoon, melting the thing on the spoon, taking a syringe, wrapping a little uh, plastic thing around their arm, tapping their, their veins until their, their veins popped out and injecting the syringe into their arm. If babies, if 80% of a baby's brain develops between birth and five, then don't you believe that all of that which they experience is lodged within their system, is there for the rest of their lives? I don't want to have memories of mama shooting crack, smoking, shooting, shooting heroin, smoking crack, and doing all the things that happened, but yet they did, and those memories are there. Mama's boyfriend taught us in to take a bath. Not my daddy, not my brother's daddy, but mama's third boyfriend. Now you know that the higher the number of female, uh, male companions a female has in her life, the greater the chance of abuse of the children who are not the, the companion's children. And so, so mom's boyfriend called us in to take a bath. I didn't come in. I'm riding my little brother around on our big wheel outside on 730 San Pedro in L.A. And by the time we came in, he was angry and he was hot. That's a lethal combination. He ran into a scalding hot water. He stripped my two-year-old baby brother's clothes off and submerged him in a tub of scalding hot water. I watched as my brother was screaming, burning. Mama's boyfriend used to thump us on the head and beat us with little things that we didn't do what he wanted us to do. And yet tonight was the worst abuse we had experienced. Mama was right there, but she was too high to do anything about it. My 
Um, the, no, my boyfriend took my brother out of the tub, and it looked like the outer layers of his skin were peeling. Trauma nurses have confirmed to me that a baby's skin exposed to that kind of trauma could indeed be peeling off, not in a literal way, but could be uh, great, greatly damaged. And, and so what I saw that night has never left my mind. Fortunately, my brother didn't die that night. Because how many of you know that 40% of all child fatalities in America are under the age of one? And that was the night we changed. Mama's boyfriend was carted off to jail. Somebody called the police. We ended up at, um, at, at LA General Hospital, and we were never placed together again. They were practicing kinship placements in 1972-73. And so as a result of that, I lived with a couple of different foster homes, one for a month, one for a week, one for a to recuperate from his burns. His, his daddy's parent, uh, great aunt, came to get him from the hospital, raised him. My mama went on to have two more babies by the same man. Wow. 27 years of her life she spent in and out this abusive relationship. And then, so we often ask the question, what makes a woman stay with her abuser? And that often re-victimizes a woman. We often start asking, what makes a man put his hands on a woman? Because that's also the challenge that we need to challenge our boys. We need to help our boys understand making babies don't make you a man. We need to understand by having, help our girls understand by having that boy's baby is it going to keep him with you. So we've got education to do for our children. And so long story short, mama ended up overdosing on, I don't know what, all I know is that I got a call one night that mama had overdosed on the streets of LA. With her was the same man for 27 years of her life had abused her and her children. And the hardest thing they had to do was fly home in seminary at Princeton and eulogize my mama. And that day only strengthened my resolve to say we've got to do something better to break the cycle of child abuse and family disintegration in the United States of America. And so I, I go on to share that my mama, Janice Armstrong, I'm, I'm her oldest boy, and I conclude that my mama's life was not lived in vain. She was 45 years of age. She never saw me preach a sermon. She never saw me graduate from Princeton Seminary. She did come to Stanford's graduation, but she was too high, and she didn't appreciate that her son, her oldest boy, wrestled with his own inadequacies. Should I, I, did I really deserve to be at Stanford? I, I wrestled with that, but then I had to tell myself, no, I was too high depressed. I did as much. I worked as hard. I deserved to be here. But a kid who has gone through that kind of traumatization and victimization always is wrestling with confidence. And so, Mama, I'm Janice Armstrong's oldest boy. The last boy she had, my youngest brother, was left addicted to crack cocaine in the hospital. The same woman that went and raised my second brother went to the hospital to get my fourth brother raised him. My last two brothers, one got involved in Crips, another one got involved with Bloods and street gangs in South Central LA. And one of them lived, both of them lived, praise God, to tell the story, but one of them is still hanging out there because he is still wrestling with his identity because of what he was exposed to as a child. And so regretfully, I am in touch with my brothers. And I am challenging them and myself to say, it does not matter where you start, what matters is where you finish. And I'm here to tell you, you here in Delaware, and my brothers and sisters in New Jersey, and my brothers and sisters in California, that none of us, few of us, are born with a silver spoon in our mouths. Very few of us always have it going on. Most of us, all of us, have had to wrestle and struggle with some things in our lives. But I'm here to say that this young boy from South Central LA, right, who was born addicted, who, whose, whose mother was addicted to substance abuse, had some angels along my way. And I'm grateful for my grandma, who prayed for me in and out of foster care. And said, I don't care where you are, I will pray on my knees and set up some timber to say, God, take care of my grandson. I never lived with grandmama after I was five. When mama wanted to be a mama, she picked me up. When she didn't want to be a mama, she dropped me off. From birth to five, that was my mama. And that still is my mama, my big mama. Where mama called her? And I just left Oprah a couple of, uh, two days ago in California. She's on Dallas at age two, but thank God she's doing fine. That's one of my angels. Another one of my angels. My
granddad. My granddad, who took me in when I was eight and came to prevent me from going back into the system. He's one of my angels. He since died, but had he not opened his home and took me in, I'd be back in the false care system in South Central LA. Another one of my angels, my pastor, who met me when I was eight years old at the Holy Life Missionary Baptist Church and used to say, God will be a mama when you don't have one, and God will be a father when you don't have one. And little did he know that little eight-year-old Darrell was in that congregation, didn't have a daddy, wasn't with my mama, and I said, give me more, pastor. To this day, he's still the pastor of Holy Life. And don't you know, I just preached at Holy Life two days ago that spoke to Sunday school teachers and youth advisors who knew me when I was 8, 9, 10, 12, 16, graduated from Stanford, graduated from Princeton. And every time I come back, I say, never underestimate what you can do for a little child that you are in And I know more time, I'm trying to wrap it up, John. Roberta Hawkins, one of my first social workers when I was five, six years old, she used to pick me up. As you can see, she's a white woman. That's, right. That's what I make the obvious known. <laughs> and the reason I say that, because you don't have to be of the same race to help a child.